Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this channel. Um, this is going to be a different kind of video. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody who has subscribed in recent days. Past 2000, that's incredible to me. I just, I never expected to get above, I mean like, I remember when I first got a few subscribers, I was like 20 or 25, and I was like, I can't believe it, I got the 20 subscribers. This is nuts. So thanks, uh, you know, to everybody who has been coming along and is watching the videos. That's awesome. Um, I wanted to do something to be like, hey, I got 2,000 subscribers, so I made an adventure. It's called The Blessed and the Beast, and it's just a thing I threw together the last couple of days, and I thought, you know, that'd be kind of cool to, I don't know, give something back to the community, because I've been doing these videos, people have been subscribing. Um, yeah, I don't know. You guys are all cool. So I just wanted to throw something out there. So this is the first adventure I've ever put out for like, you know, the public, I guess you might say. So we'll see how it goes. But I'm pretty happy with it. I think it's pretty fun. Um, it's for Shadow Dark, and it's it's a mid-level adventure. It's like for level four and five, um, and so it's not like a starter adventure or something like that. But I just wanted to kind of include some cool, I don't know, higher level stuff in it. So I decided to to do so. Um, so I'll just click through it in this video, and then um, I'll put a link below where we can get it. It's on Drive Through RPG. It's free. Uh, I don't want to make people buy it. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so uh, it's just going to be available for anybody who wants it. Um, and, and, you know, if you just want to take some inspiration from it, I think there's a lot of cool ideas here. If you don't want to run it straight up, but just add it to your collection. Hey, you know, whatever. So, The Blessed and the Beast. It's about a chimera, which is why I thought this piece of public domain art, which I found online, was really, really cool. It's gruesome and dark. It's from like the 18th century. I love this piece. So, decided to put that on there because it's about a chimera. Um, and so, okay, the adventure is, yeah, The Blessed and the Beast. An adventure for four level... Uh, four, level four through five characters. Uh, it's by Red Mage GM. That's me. I did. I used one map from Dyson Logos at the very end, so um, it's a really good map. I like it a lot, and I just wanted to include that. So here, there's the link to Dyson Logos' blog. And then I have the uh, Knight at the Crossroads, which is another public domain piece that I thought was really cool. And the Blessed is this knight, so I thought, oh, I'll put something like that there. And I thought also the landscape was kind of how I was sort of picturing... I mean, it's nicer, but it's sort of how I was picturing the landscape of this adventure, so I think it fit really well with that. Um, anyway, yeah, let's go through a little bit. So, an adventure overview. The idea is the PCs are traveling through a time-shifting and chaos-warped ancient battlefield, and they find the ruined castle at the center, and that's where the Dread Beast makes its lair. The party finds itself shifting between the present, the ancient past when the castle fa fell, and the more recent past... When a holy hero who came to fight the beast perished, as echoes of past figures, undead, and spawn from the chaotic energy itself shift in and out of reality around them. So basically the idea is, this is sort of a location-based adventure. It's, I don't give you any reason why you might be coming here in this adventure. I give you some suggestions at the very end in a little section. But for the most part, it's just a place and some of the surrounding places. And then the, th the things that are there. And so basically there is this ancient battlefield. It was ruined, destroyed by chaos magic. And at the center of that battlefield was a castle. It was all ruined centuries ago. And then over time, the chaos magic, which was sort of like, you know, suffused into the area, sort of amalgamated itself into this beast, a kind of chimera, a being of malice and power. And it's been tormenting this road that passes nearby the, the pilgrims away. And so decades ago, this great hero, the blessed Antinous, made a vow to slay the creature. And he went out and he never came back. And now, Here's the, there's the battlefield, the Dread Beast is still around, it's Chaos Spawn, and, unbeknownst to the heroes, the Blessed Antinous is still there, you know, in a sense, trapped and warped in chaos and time. And the fort is surrounded by that battlefield, some parts of which are strangely preserved. So basically, you're sort of like crossing the battlefield, you get to the ruin, and you go into it, and you fight the beast. Or however you want to approach it, but that's kind of the uh, overview that, as I saw it. So you begin at the edge of the outer battlefield, and I had kind of this idea for a bit of a point crawl or something like that. Well, you don't have to use it that way. Basically, I, I have a sort of a <laughs> an outer ring, an inner ring, and then the castle at the very center. And I only have the map of the castle. I don't have a map of the battlefield. So it's kind of up to you to, to lay it out as you see fit. But basically, the general idea is it takes a couple hours to travel through each zone, the outer battlefield, the inner battlefield, and then the, the ruin itself. And I've added a couple locations that are in each of those zones. And you can either use them as I say here, you can use them as set encounters, like the players come across them, or like off the path sites, right? Like the, the 
the, in the distance the players see it and they can choose to ignore it or, or engage with it as they want. Or you can do more like a point crawl, right? Like you're, you start at the edge and you can choose to either head towards the, the giant colossus or the, the old the lake over there. And then once you've picked that, after that you can choose to head towards the, the campsite or the last stand. And then after whichever one you pick, you go to the ruin. So it's, you can choose either way, right? So sort of more point crawl or, or just set encounters. Or again, it can be the sort of thing where it's just, you know, you lay it out as you want. Uh, you can just, you know, <laughs> lay it out on as you want on your map. Um, but, which you can easily draw up for it, because I didn't put one, but it's sort of... I didn't feel like it needed one. Now, I said note the danger level for each zone, and I put a little asterisk there, and that's because Shadow Dark uses danger levels, right? So overland travel has a, a certain danger level. Unsafe uh, overland travel, you check for random encounters once every three hours. Risky, you check once every two hours, and deadly, you check every hour. But I said, you know, consider changing that, given the size of this kind of overland travel, I said consider changing it to danger level every 10 minute segments, basically every turn. So what that would mean is, like, instead of one hour segments, you use 10 minute segments. So that would mean unsafe regions you check uh, every 30 minutes, right, because every three rounds, which would be twice per hour. And then the risky areas would be three times per hour, and then deadly is six times per hour. So, you know, once you've gotten to the Ruin, you're rolling a random encounter check every turn, and it could have a bunch back-to-back. -back. Now, that might be a bit too much. It's up to you to, to decide how you want to run this. I think that it's not enough to run it once every three hours, given how small the outer region is. Um, but doing it every round might be a bit much. So that's why I had this sort of, you know, increasing risk as you go, and unsafe, risky, and deadly. Um, but that's what I would recommend, changing it to that. So the outer battlefield has two locations, the Ruined Colossus of Bone and the, the Crater Lake. And uh, the outer battlefield is a mess of broken standards, rusted armor, the remains of huge machines of war brought to bear by the forces of each side. The inner battlefield has the campsite of Blessed Antinous and the last stand of the shield wall. And uh, it's made up of long trenches, field works, and the blasted remains of thousands. And then the ruin itself, which is the ruined fort, the lair of the beast, and the last stand of Blessed Antinous. Now, um, I used colors here to help differentiate the sections, and that was going to be a bigger element. I, was, I basically colored the different sections with that font. Uh, but it was just a little bit harder to read than I would have liked. So I kept the color for like the heading and for some other things, but mostly I just changed it to the standard black. Now, one thing I did do though, is I, I hyperlinked the text. So you can click on the different parts and it'll take you right there. Um, and I did that throughout. So it's all hyperlinked. There's no table of contents, but it's only a 13 page document. So I figure you can finally find your way through pretty, pretty easily. Second page is the random encounter page. And this is where you just get like what you'll be rolling for random encounters when you roll them. So if you roll it, uh, you roll a d4, and you can get one of four things, a Chaos Wave, Undead, a Time Echo, or the Beast. If you roll a Chaos Wave, then you roll a d4 to see what effect happens there. Either you can summon some Warp Spawn, which uh, you can click on, it takes you to the Beastie I included in the back. Winged Spawn, which are just different variations on that. Wings, they're weaker, but there's a lot more of them. And then the Warp Brute, which is a big dude who as you might expect, is a, sort of a warp thing. Now, what's interesting about these encounters is that you only fight them. They only appear for D6 rounds. So you might roll a 1 on the rounds, which means the players panic, start casting spells, and then they warp out of existence. Right? So I like this idea of having these creatures kind of warping in. Maybe it's even pretty frequently, especially if you're at the Ruin. Right? You're going to be rolling every turn. Uh, and if you roll a 6 on that random encounter check, uh-oh, you just had more, more creatures. So, uh, you know, you're going to probably have a lot of these, but they're not going to last too long. One round, two rounds. You might roll six rounds, in which case you probably have a full fight on your hands, but it might be only a round or two. And that's kind of interesting because it's not about necessarily dealing damage. It's more about surviving. Maybe you can kill a couple really quickly so that if it is a few rounds, but the players don't know how long the fight is. They just know that these things warp in and out of existence. So kind of interesting there, I thought. And if you roll four there, time shifts. Now, time shifts are basically a way of, in, in this, I was thinking of making it like, making it clear that you are jumping back and forward in time. And so if that time shift occurs, you're, you roll to see, you find yourself in the middle of the ancient battle. The whole party does. And each PC has to roll, and they have to make a DC 12 dex, uh, you know, a, a normal dex check to avoid being struck by either an arrow, a blade, a bone scythe, or a wave of healing magic, right? So they might try to dodge out of the way, but it turns out it's just a spell of healing. So 3d6. So there's a little bit of benefit that can happen if you roll a 4, if you roll a 1, and then a 4, and then a 4. So it's pretty unlikely that you're going to get that wave of healing magic. But it's not, you know, what is that? 1 in 4, 1 in 4, 1 in 4. Uh, what was that? 16, uh, 64. Yeah, it's pretty unlikely. Or 32. It's a 1 in 32 chance, right? Am I crazy? 
16. No, 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 it's four. Yeah, I was right. I was right the first time. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Okay. So it's re relatively unlikely that you're going to get healed, but not impossible. And because every PC rolls, it's more likely that somebody's going to get that. Um, or if they all roll for the time shift. Like the whole party shifts, but then each player has to see what happens to them individually. And now when I ran this, or this variation of this for my West Marches, this was a lot of fun. Not because of the effect. The effect wasn't terribly... I mean, it was just damage, right? Mostly. But the players loved this sensation of like being shifted through time and seeing the battle around them and then leaping back. It's a really cool narrative thing. And I think it, it, it changed the tone of an otherwise kind of like lonesome adventure where you're kind of walking through this barren battlefield. Suddenly they're surrounded by people and there's a battle and then they'll jump back. And I really had, it was a lot of fun doing things like, you know, seeing the, 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 the weapon that struck them and the, the figure that struck them looking shocked and then taking an arrow to the neck or something like that. And then when they warp back in time, there's a you know, skeletal corpse with an arrow through its neck right at their feet. So like that guy, you know, you see him drop and then you see the, 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 the you know, ancient ruin remains of him. Uh, however many long, however many centuries later. Now, again, you might say, well, all this stuff would be gone centuries later, but there's this idea of warp and time shifting, so, <laughs> you know, you can have the remnants of a battle in that idea. So anyway, that's what happens if you do a chaos wave. If you roll an undead, then you get some undead. Uh, 2d6 skeletons with half with bows, d8 beastman ghouls, 50% chance led by a ghast, d4 whites, or a legionary ghost. Um, you could roll for, especially for the ghost, I think you could probably roll like a, a reaction table if you wanted to, to, to make him not necessarily hostile. I think the other three make sense that they'd be hostile, but the ghost doesn't have to be. Um, I didn't put a reaction table on here because I figure you can do that yourself if you wanted to include it. I mean, you could do that technically with any of the creatures here. And I could see there being some interesting reasons why the warp spawn. They're chaos. They might not attack you, right? So maybe they don't. Uh, so you could definitely include that if you wanted. The third thing that you can roll on here is a time echo, and I really like these ones. So a time echo is an NPC from period in the past. So basically after the battle... But before the present moment, people have entered this battlefield, right? Adventurers or whoever else. Well, anyone who enters in here kind of gets stuck in this warp, or at least they can, or an echo of them can. And so these people have all probably passed on, done their thing, but, but time is weird here. And so you can run into them. And so there's four of them I, I rolled up. There's Mateo, beloved of Gide. There's the Seer of Sasaya. There's Halithak. And there's Zaldo and Rhyme. And I think this, I don't know, I kind of had fun with him. So Mateo, he's a human glider. He's grandiose. He's always you know, very bold and ostentatious. And he's um, seeking uh, the spear of his ancestor who died at the shield wall, supposedly died at the shield wall. And then each of them have something, some benefit that they can give you, or at least the first three do. So Mateo, if you help him out, if you get to the shield wall with him and you do go through this thing and find his ancestor's spear for him, then he can tell you a secret. He saw a beast, he saw it attack, and he can subtract one or he can tell you, and then you get the beast has a minus one on all of its attack rolls against the party because it tells them how the you know tells the party the pattern. And so basically, they it's not as effective against them. They know what they're looking for. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, now the seer Sasea, she's an impatient elven priestess. She was attacked. She and her retinue fled into the into into the uh, the battlefield, and they got separated. War probably separated them the way you know the time separated them. And she knows that a couple of her attendants at least are still alive. So, you know, still alive in her time, at the campsite, which is a place. And so if, you, if the PCs help her get there, and she follows them there, and if they do get there, then um, she can warn them of the next three hostile encounters. Basically, you roll them right away, and then you tell the PCs what they're going to be. The next three times they roll a hostile encounter, um, this is what it will be. So basically, the next three times, you just I would say just roll on the Chaos Wave or the Undead Table or the Beast, right? Just roll D4 three times and uh, ignore time shifts that you roll and ignore time echoes that you roll. Uh, roll and just you know roll out three random encounters and then she tells them that's what she sees so it gives them a bit of knowledge ahead of time you know okay the next time we encounter something it's going to be this and so maybe we can know it'll only be here for a couple rounds maybe it'll only be here uh oh it's going to be you know 12 winged spawn for six rounds yikes we got to use our resource as well basically gives you a bit of a heads up Halithak is a half orc assassin if you can heal him and if you can convince him that you're actually going to avenge his friends because they all died against the beast then he can reveal a weakness in the creature. And that'll reduce the AC of the beast by one. I think it's, it's, it's 16. It'll be down to 15. So it's pretty good. An extra 5% chance to hit it. And then Zaldo and Rhyme. Two unscrupulous goblin cultists who seek the time warp relic. Time warp relic. The thing that's causing this. 
from the rune itself, and they will stop at nothing to get it. One is friendly, one is not so friendly, and they ran afoul of the Hermit at the Crater Lake. So if you happen to run into them, they might be able to tell you about the, the Hermit and the magic items he has. As you'll see, there, he has some magic items that might be valuable and useful. And, um, and yet, they're interested in going to the ruins, so maybe they could talk. They're trying to get the players basically to let them have the relic, which would be very bad if they get it, because they're, they're pretty awful. But, you know, they're only going to be here. One of the things that's interesting, or I, I think it's interesting, is that the time shift, um, the NPCs that you roll here remain in the PC's timeline for D4 hours or until a time shift occurs. Now, one of the notes I have at the end is that you could definitely expand that if you wanted. You could have them stay for longer if you liked these NPCs or if your players did. Or you could have them, you know, kind of like recur. They come back, they warp back in every time there's a chaos wave or something like that. It's up to you how you wanted to do that. But um, if you just, uh, <laughs> if you don't like these guys at all and you still want to use them for a little bit or something like that, then you could have them roll up. They only stay for an hour or two and then they just like vanish in the next time shift. They're just, they don't come back, right? They're gone. And then you have the beast itself, the chaos beast itself. If you roll it the first time, uh, the players just see it. They get a sense of what is flying far away in the battlefield. But if you roll it again, then it spots the party and it makes a dive attack. And it gets four attacks, basically. It gets two hoof attacks, a bite attack, and a tentacle attack. So, and then it also gets its spines. So essentially, I just use the chimera, but I change the flavor of the attacks and I weaken some of the attacks. Um, that's basically it. I just weakened it a slight, slightly. So it's a chimera that's a little bit weaker. Um, so, just just barely, barely though, the damage has just been reduced, basically. Uh, but it now has more variety in its attacks. So, and in one of those attacks is a, is a toss ability, and it can trap you in a tentacle. Like, so I think it's an even, it's an even trade. But if it takes any damage in that, it, warp, it flees back to the castle. Now, one of the things is, the players, theoretically, could kill it on that first flyby, if they do, right? So, for whatever reason. You might say, great, they killed it, that's it. Or you could say that, well, as long as the Time Warp Relic exists, it's going to keep respawning back in its tower. So you gotta kill it. You gotta go up there and you gotta shatter the crystal or something like that. You could, you could, um, you could play it that way. But anyway, after it's, it's been attacked once, it flees and it, you can ignore that four uh, after the second time. Either you could roll again if you don't, if you wanna have other encounters, or you could just uh, you know, say that uh, after the beast has been encountered twice out in the field, fours are nothing. Then you get the my description of the two sections, or the, the outer battlefield, the inner battlefield. And by the way, the way that I designed it, so if you do a two-page spread, which you can on PDF, obviously, um, things should work out pretty well. Uh, you should be able to, uh, everything's kind of in two-page spreads. So if you go back to the adventure overview and the random encounters, it's one spread. The two areas of the battlefield are, are another spread. You'll see that the, uh, the, 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 the dungeon itself is on four pages and each of them have two-page spreads with a map. And then the final page with the creature stat blocks and the appendices for magic items and notes. It's also on a two-page spread. So basically, I just try to make sure that it was always, if you wanted to do that two-page spread, uh, you can just, you can get it all right there. I also want to, uh, in the file on the drive, you, you get the map separately. It's in here three times on two separate pages and on the back page. Uh, you also get it as a separate JPEG file. And then I also included all of my, my Word document with just the text. And so you can edit that, you can print it, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, again, it's free on... Uh, Drive your RPG, so just do whatever you want with the adventure if you want it. So the outer battlefield, though, you get the ruined Colossus of Bone, which is a cracked and moss-covered remains of a many-legged Colossus, a many-legged uh, construct of bone and rusted metal, shaped like the crawlers that created them. But on a larger scale, these colossi were fearsome weapons of war. This one is nearly half shattered against a rocky rise in the battlefield where it fell, but three inner chambers are intact. It serves as the nest of dozens of winged spawn, which phase in and out around it. From inside, periodic yelps and cries for help can be heard. So maybe there's a reason for the players to go. They hear those help, cries for help, they'll go, ah, maybe we should go help. Maybe not. But one of the things that I wanted this, this is sort of ambiguous, right? Cracked and moss-covered remains of a many-legged construct of bone and rusted metal. It's shaped like the crawlers that created them. Well, in this world, I mean, my world, I kind of know what that is, but you guys can use whatever you want. So I like the idea of leaving it more ambiguous and take, letting you take it the direction that you want, rather than being like, this is exactly what this is. Just kind of more... Like, you get enough of what it actually is to use it, right? But it's more ambiguous, and that might be fine for your players, too. Like, maybe their characters, maybe the characters don't know a lot about this, and so they're just like, it's just this weird, bony, steely colossus that's overgrown and has this warp stuff. Anyway, crack door leading to the interior, swarms of winged spawn, 3d6, present at any one time. Each ongoing round of conflict has a 1 in 3 chance of spawning another d6, so 
gotta kill them all quickly, or they'll 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 start to pile up. Now, if you have a mage in your party with fireball, it should be pretty easy to clear it out. Just send it a blast. But there might be a, a danger of doing that. Um, and you could make it if you wanted. You could say that the core might explode or something like that. Because at the core of the largest nest lies an intact bloodstone heart. It's immensely valuable. It's the thing that powered this thing in the first place. I don't say that, but I think it's implied. Hard strength to remove without shattering it. So you can pull it out, and it's really hard to pull it out, but and, and it's hard to do it without breaking it. But you can break it out. And if you consume it whole, so it's valuable, you could sell it, obviously, and get fabulous XP for that. Or you can consume it whole. You just eat it, this big core, this rock, this stone. And if you do, you heal to max hit points when you do, and your con increases by two. So it's basically a full heal and a massive con boost. Or not massive, it's plus two. So it's really valuable as an item in and of itself, but you also can sell it for three XP for the party. So, you know, which way do you want to go that way with it? Or you could run it where they get the XP anyway, if they recover it. But in the side chamber, you get a time echo of Cosmo Longfoot, a querulous halfling thief who sought the heart for himself, currently tangled on the mesh sinew and phased webs. And there's a spider-like warp brute. You can cast web, DC 12 plus one, in place of a tentacle attack, and that prepares to devour him. So it's got this web that it can do and use its tentacles to try to wrap you up. And then Cosmo will pledge his services to those who rescue him. He fades at first time shift. So he's there for a while and fades away. You can ignore that if you want. He, maybe he's not a tech. Maybe he's not an echo. Maybe he's in the PC's uh, time. Maybe he's the one they've been sent to find. Maybe he's part of a rival party. Maybe he's an old friend. Whatever you want to do, up to you. But this is just how I was thinking of it. You have the Crater Lake itself. I really like this one. <laughs> so there's a massive crater hundreds of yards wide in the battlefield from some explosive blast ancient. It's become a small lake, right? It's filled with water over time. And at the center is a small island. And on that island is a small shack that's been erected with smoke rising from a primitive chimney. And a patchwork coracle is pulled up on the island. So there's a little residence out there. The island is inhabited by Snick, a garrulous troll that seeks enlightenment. So there's a troll on the island. He's kind of like a hermit, right? He's like, yeah, I'm just living here. And he can survive the chaos warp because he's a troll. But he hankers after meat, right? All he's got are these like weird chaos beasts and undead to eat. And he's, he's a troll, so he can survive on that. But he's tired of feeding on the dead that wander through. He wants a real feast. And, well, a party is a feast, right? So he's going to try to convince them by any means, fair or foul, to come back with him to his hut, preferably one at a time, right? So, oh yeah, I'll send my coracle over. I'll come over and bring you back one at a time. And then he wants to eat them. He has several items of immense value that he has pilfered from other adventurers in the past. To get any one, grants normal XP. To get two or more, grants fabulous XP. And these items are a potion of invisibility and a potion of healing, boots of hovering that he can't wear, two goblin bombs that he took from a, the gang that came through, of which the two cultists are a member, the ones that we talked about earlier. Um, and then he has a ring of Rumlot that he can't wear, but he talks to it because it can talk, right? Or it has some sort of communication. At least how I think of it in the magic, in the uh, in the book. By the way, all of this stuff that's bolded or um, like the creatures and the magic items and stuff that I don't specifically talk about in this, they're all referenced and detailed in the Shadow Dark book. Uh, if you don't play Shadow Dark, if you're just going to use this for another system, or if you want to use these ideas but for your game of choice, then you could just come up with whatever you want. The ring of Rumlot, for example, is just a magic item that helps you cast spells, but it's cursed and it's intelligent. And it likes doing evil things. So take that as you want. <laughs> and then what I said at the very end is if the party finds a way to feed him large amount of meat peacefully, he'd be more than happy to give a reward, right? So he can give them maybe one of these things, maybe two of these things if it's really good, probably just one, unless you want to take the fight and kill him or, or risk fighting him. Now, again, if the party has fireball, they could just fireball the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the hut from the shore. But then I would say the bombs go off, the boots of hovering are destroyed, the potion of invisibility, the potion of healing are gone, the ring of rum lot is blasted. Maybe that survives, but it blasts into the lake or something. Right? So if they take the path out, right, if they just use fire on the hut, then the bombs go off and uh, the whole place blows up and it's, it's uh, you know, they don't get anything from it. So, now they, they're not necessarily going to know that that's the case, but if they just fireball a hut, then that's, all, that's on them. Um, so that's the outer battlefield. I like both of these locations, like they're kind of cool. Get the inner battlefield, which is the campsite of the Blessed Antinous. Uh, even from a distance, anyone can see that this hollow with a few growing trees, a marvel in this otherwise blasted battlefield, is a place of safety and security. The warp waves cease, and time seems to stand still here. The breeze is light and almost pleasant. An armored man, small in stature, kneels with his sword point down in quiet prayer. He flickers in and out of reality, the image fluttering this way and that like a candle flame. So this is Blessed Antinous. If you pray with him, you get a benefit. If you disturb him or distract him or try to wake him up, 
Well, then he's not so happy, but he disappears, and a wraith appears where he was. Now, I, I originally had this be his ghost. You could do that if you wanted it to be kind of dark, like he's, you know, he's, his undead spirit's been trapped here. But you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Either way, um, it's a wraith. Now, if Asaya is with the party, her handmaids are here, they're reunited, and this is when she gives them her gift, right? That's the idea. Then you have the last stand of the shield wall. This one's a bit trickier. I could see a lot of people just skipping it because they don't really know how to run it. I, I'm not, myself, I'm not totally sure, but I think it's cool, and I just I wanted to include it. So the idea is there is a mass of unmoving figures that have been locked in time. These are people from the battle, beastmen and legionaries, right? like the, the actual ancient battle that was being fought here. They're still here, frozen in time. And at the center of that, you know, all the legionaries are surrounding her, trying to protect her, and the, the beastmen are surrounding them. So there's a big melee and mass but, and mob, but at the center is this woman in a white robe and armor, She's plucking a red marble from a ring on her finger and she's about to throw it into the beastman. So that's a ring of fireballs. And it's in the center of all these things. So, hey, if you can get to it, that's awesome. But if you touch any of the beastmen, they rapidly rot and wither. Or if you do damage. So, for example, if, if you disturb them, then those ones rot and wither, yes. But every time one of them is touched or disturbed, then another one wakes up. Well, first of all, the one itself wakes up, but then it has it, it wakes up another one. So if either Beastman or Legionary is touched, roll a d6. On a 4 through 6, it wakes, it awakens another with it. Roll again for that one and repeat until a 1 through 3 is rolled. So if you have this whole mass and like, hey, we'll just blow our way with spells or fireballs. Like has burning hands a few times to melt away these dudes and we'll get in there. Well, yeah, you kill a few and then this warp effect would occur. So say you kill six of them. Well, now each of those can trigger... <laughs> more and more and more of them. So if the party tries to just like blow up a bunch of them, then they're going to have a big fight on their hands suddenly because suddenly you're going to get a bunch of ghouls and ghasts and whites and skeletons and ghosts. Now, maybe you... This is why I say it's a bit complicated because, you know, <laughs> you're going to have to negotiate this. But I just like the idea so much that I wanted to include it. Leave it out if you want. But the idea is that there's a centurion with a spear. Mateo wants that. Uh, and so you have to get to it. You can either come up with a cool plan. The players come up with a cool plan to grab it. I don't know, you know, fish for it, right? Or do something like that. Uh, and, and if they want the Ring of Fireballs, she's right in the center, how are they going to get to her without just disturbing all of them? All, you know, nearly 90, or it was 83 of them, 82 of them, uh, and make it through. Because they don't want to fight 82 creatures. Even if, you know, a third of them, a quarter of them, are going to turn to dust. Well, the rest are still going to be there, and they're going to fight them. So once they figure out that to touch one of these things wakes it up, Probably they'll do that, they'll touch a couple, and then they'll come to life and they'll have to fight them as undead. Then they're going to start to realize, oh, okay, how are we going to do this? Now, one thing that you might say is if they have a cleric, just turn undead. And that would certainly work against a lot of these, right? But I would say they only turn to undead once they're awakened. So you have to actually wake them up first, and then that's a risk. I mean, because if you, you know, if you wake up a whole bunch and try to turn undead all at once, well, you might lose the spell, some of them might save. So I actually think it's fairly resilient to those sorts of easy solutions, to fireball or to turn undead or to things like that. The players can try to brute force it, they can try to be clever, or they can ignore it. But there's a ring of fireballs in it if they can figure it out. Now, in Shadow Dark, the ring of fireballs is just you can cast fireball once a day from the ring. That's pretty cool. Very powerful. All right. And you get the rune fort itself. Essentially, you have a bunch of ruins, uh, a bunch of buildings, and there's really the one main one, which is the tower, and that's, that's two through five. That's the main tower where the beast is. But I included a couple side buildings. Um, six, seven, eight, and nine has a magic item called a standard, and it's what sort of... It's mixing... It has its own magic of protection, but it's mixing with the chaos magic to cause the undead. So that's why there are these legionaries and these, these beast men who are still fighting, as if they've been warped by the sort of com combination of the warp magic and this this standard, this golden standard, which protected the legion was the idea so it's a magic item you can recover and if you do disturb it or you break it or you take it away then the undead will stop and that is another you know removal from the random encounter table the undead don't occur and then i had some like interesting statues and like kind of interactions around here like if you try to enter the tower there's a statue that says like hey you know yeah well i'll read through it it's uh, the first guardian he's right outside the he's an a right here um you know this little bit right here uh, and he says, um, Well, the chaos magic of the place has infused this statue with movement and speech. It turns to face any who approach the tower steps and calls it a challenge. It seeks deference and submission. 
If that is not given, it bellows and leaps from the pedestal, but crashes into dust upon landing. And then you roll a random encounter check. So it causes a random encounter. Right there. Uh, if it is given, it smiles proudly and nods in acceptance before turning back and lands the stone. Whoever showed reverence, either by bowing or kneeling or doing something, right, gains a plus one to all checks for the next eight hours. It's really strong. But, you know, players, they don't really like to bow down to things that demand they bow. Some players might, but a lot don't. So I think this would be interesting because some of them will bow, some of them won't. If, if none do, if some do, they'll be mad and jump and cause a random encounter. But those who, those who did might get a benefit. Anyway, that's one. I, I really like that one. I really like the second Guardian and the third Guardian, too. They're kind of on similar lines, especially the third Guardian I liked. It's a little dangerous, though. A well-preserved mosaic in blue and gold of, of a line of soldiers facing an ice dragon. The chaos magic places infused it with movement. The battle begins to transpire as you're looking at these mosaic tiles, and the soldiers seem to be on the losing side. So if you just watch, then the dragon consumes the rest of the soldiers, turns, and breathes uh, an icy blast that comes out of the mosaic and hits the party. But... If they, like, start breaking the, the tiles and defeat the dragon, right? If the party thinks to, like, help the soldiers, because it's all moving, well, then they defeat the dragon, and then they turn and salute the party, and the party gets a plus one AC for the next eight hours. Then the mosaic fades. I, I really liked that one. I thought it's cool. So basically, there's some optional things that are really quick that you can do that'll give you a little benefit or, or drawback if you engage with it, but it's not a big thing. It's not going to take too long, any of these guardians. Then you get the tower f ground floor. There's some interesting things, I think, going on there. There's the locked room, which is basically, it's a time sink. There's a benefit to coming in here. It's a time sink. Um, and it's a danger because if they open up that door, then there's this crawler, dead, skeletal in the room. Well, if you get the time warp relic from the, the, the nest upstairs and put it back in the socket of the thing's head where it was before it was wrenched out, well, then it comes back to life. And it's, that's like a campaign-level villain. So this thing, like, breaks out, goes, and starts terrorizing the world. So that would be a way to, like, continue on if, for whatever reason, this happens. And that's precisely what those two little goblins I was talking about want to do. So if you wanted to make this, like, a longer thing, maybe they follow the party along and they try to do this. They, they try to ingratiate themselves with the party so that they can get this relic and then find the remains of this thing and put it in the, the head socket. Of course, it's going to annihilate them instantly. The, par the, the, the goblins, I mean, not the party. I mean, it could, I suppose, but that'd be kind of unfair. I would say it, like, kills the goblins, rushes out, breaks out through the wall, and just, like, flies away or crawls away, and you're like, uh-oh, what have we just unleashed? Um, but that's assuming they... I mean, the players could do that too, right? They could be like, oh, wow, that socket. I wonder what happens if we put this back into that. I mean, are they really going to be dumb enough? If they did that, I would say the thing should be, like, grateful and maybe give them a dark blessing before it goes out and does stuff. And then they're like, uh-oh, what did we do? That would actually be kind of a cool campaign if they decided to go that way. I doubt they will, though. Um, yeah, I have a link to the goblins just in case. <laughs> Then you get the Lair of the Beast with a lot of magic items there. You get the plus one chainmail, the prayer book of St. Antinous. You get some uh, experience points based on the, the rewards you find, and then you get the Time Warp Relic itself. And, of course, the Beast, which is going to be there. Um, now, one of the things that's a little bit... I hadn't thought about this, but the Relic is there, and the Beast itself is here. And if you break the, if you break the Relic, then all the Chaos Warp stuff ceases. I think the Beast should still be around. Even if you break it, it should, it should come back in a rage and try to kill you. Because... Um, if it just, like, if, if you sneak up here, the beast is away, you smash it, and that's the end, you can do that if you want. But um, maybe maybe smashing it hurts the beast or stuns it or something like that. So if they think to break it in the middle of the fight, uh, you get a benefit for it. But that's kind of beyond what I had planned. I didn't think about that really when I was designing it there. Then you get 6, 7, and 8. Not 6, 7, 8, and 9, which is sort of where the legionaries had their last stand. They barricaded themselves in here, and then the, the, the big you know, wave of magic killed everything and destroyed it all. So there's still in here a skeletal form. There's some mutiny happening here, or at least a mutiny between one, and there's a little duel happening that's kind of eternal, keeps going on and on and on as these two figures keep fighting. Some magic items in here, but they're cursed. And then there's some really good magic items, like the, the unbroken standard and a little uh, amulet that gives you protection against chaos spells. So there's some cool stuff in here, but it's totally optional. And one of the things that I didn't say in here, but I, I could have, was that if you if you don't want this whole thing to be in here, just this whole building, six, seven, eight, nine, is just a ruin, right? It's just rubble. You could ignore all this if you didn't like it. If you just wanted it to be just the tower and the beast and ignore the rest of the stuff around here, totally. Go for it. Then at the very end, you get the beastry, which is the beast itself, and it's pretty tough. As you can see, it's a chimera, so it's got that 16 AC, 49 hit points, uh, a couple attacks, a bite, tentacles, and it gets its tail spiked. It gets all of that on its turn. So it's four, five attacks, really. 
But those tail spikes, I said it only has D6 uses left before needing to regrow them, but how fast it regrows is up to you. Um, and then there are those boosts you can get, right? So if you've helped out some of the NPCs, then it's going to have minus one to hit or your uh, minus one AC. Um, there's other ways of getting like holy weapon as, you know, be, being blessed various ways in the adventure. So I actually feel like it'll probably be fairly fine as a fight for level four or five party. Um, but one of the things I really like about this fight is at the start of each round, you have to roll to see what time the players inhabit. Like, because they and the creature begin to warp through time during the fight. So on a one through three on that D6, you just keep fighting it on the present. But if you roll four or five, suddenly you're back a few decades ago where Saint, when St. Antinous or Blessed Antinous was fighting it. And so he's there. And it heals a little bit because it's gone through this warp time. But now he's, uh, but then he's there, right? And so he gets an action that round. And he can heal them or he can attack it. Probably he'll use his spells to help the party because suddenly they'll appear. Maybe that depends on how they treated his praying image, right? Maybe for him, these things just came and distracted him, and now they came and distracted him again during the fight. He might not be happy. So you can play with that as you want. Or you roll a six, and it's a distant pass. Then you roll on the time uh, the time shift table. So suddenly, they're not just fighting the, the, the creature, but they're back when the castle's under siege by the forces of chaos. And so they're all around them, and suddenly like everything's just chaos and madness for a round. And then it... You can't roll that one twice in a row. So after that, you go, you warp right back to either the present or Blessed Antinous' battle. So I really like that as it kind of makes the battle a little bit more like, I don't know, frantic. Then you get the warped creatures, the spawn, the the, the wing spawn, and the brute. Um, <laughs> basically, for the just so you guys know, the warped brute, I just used like a giant octopus stat block, basically changed a couple things. The wing spawn, I basically just used giant leeches and changed some things. And the warped spawn, I just used... Uh, um, on keg and changed a few things. That's all I did there. Then you get Blessed Antinous himself. On the next page, you get treasures and rewards. The four main things. So Blessed Antinous is sword Aradelva, Death Guard. It's stuck in the creature's back. I thought that was really cool. Like he died, he stabbed it and then died. It's a pretty powerful sword. It's a plus one great sword. You can cast cleansing weapon once per day. It can recharge under certain conditions. And it, when you reduce to zero hit points, you reduce to one instead. Once, and then you can recharge that in certain ways. Creatures slain by it can't rise as undead. That's really good. And then it's conscious, it has a personality, which is basically that of Blessed Antinous. And you can get his prayer book, you can get a, the broken, un, the unbroken standard, and the time warp, time warp relic itself, which is kind of nebulously powerful. I didn't give it particular powers, I kind of left it up to you. Either it's just the sort of thing that they have to break and that's it, and it's valuable, you can use sell the pieces, or maybe they take it, in which case you can use it, I mean, it, it manipulates the fabric of time, that could be kind of cool. Maybe that's what they're looking for. Maybe this, this is an adventure where they have to travel back in time or they have to do something with time and they got to come here to grab the relic because they know that it's it has this effect or someone tells them. And then I have some commentary here, which, you know, just little bits of, you know, ways of expanding things, ways of uh, modifying it if you want. Uh, and then the, finally I have the uh, map with this little bits of, you know, it's all hyperlinked, so you can click on it and it'll take you to the description. But just, uh, you know, annotations so that you know what's what's up on each of these. So anyway, this is The Blessed and the Beast. My first adventure uh, that I put out there for people to take a look at. I hope it's cool. I mean, I think it's cool. <laughs> I like it a lot. I hope you guys think it's cool. And I think there's a lot of fun things you could have with this. So... Uh, I haven't playtested it much at all, especially for Shadow Dark. So this is, again, this was my, this was a variation on a 5e adventure, or like the idea was from 5e and I really heavily modified it. But um, basically, as I said, built it from the ground up. So I haven't really played it much for Shadow Dark, so the numbers of monsters, the estimates of things like that, it's kind of an estimate based on my other experience with Shadow Dark, not with running this particular adventure. So playtesting would be great. And I can always come back and modify numbers, modify hit points, if things are too easy or things are too hard. So if you guys want to do that, I would be very grateful. But anyway, this is just, again, my thank you to the community for being super welcoming, super awesome. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys have found this to be interesting. All right, I will see you all in another video.